Welcome back to Game Theory 101, I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is risk preferences. Let's start off with an interactive question. I have a couple of lotteries for you. Lottery 1, half of the time it pays you nothing, and half of the time it pays you $1 million. Lottery 2 is a degenerate lottery. It pays you X dollars with certainty. My question to you is for what value X are you indifferent between these two lotteries? Obviously, if x is equal to 0, you'll prefer Lottery 1. But as x grows larger and larger, Lottery 2 begins looking more and more attractive. Eventually, if x is high enough, Lottery 2 should look more attractive than Lottery 1. That's easy to see if you, for example, plug $1 million into x. My question for you again is, what is that x value that makes you indifferent, where if x is less than that value that you've reported, you prefer lottery 1, and if x is greater than that amount that you reported, you prefer lottery 2. Think about that for a moment. If you have an answer, then in the comment section below this video, go ahead and tell me what that is, and maybe if you want to include a little bit of information about why you chose that particular amount, that'd be good to include as well. If you're ready though, let's go ahead and advance forward. No matter what you put down, I can lump you into one of three categories. Category number one is risk neutral. This is based off of the expected value of lottery one. Lottery one, again, half of the time pays you nothing, and half of the time pays you $1 million. So on average, it pays you $500,000. If you answered X equal to $500,000, then you are risk neutral. This means that you just wanted to maximize your expected value. I've conducted this question before, and historically, most people fall under this category. For this one value, $500,000, I have a majority of people reporting that amount. Category number two is the second most popular category. It's risk averse. If you answered X less than $500,000, you would fall under this category. This means that you value each additional dollar less than the last. This makes a lot of sense in some ways. Think about this. How much is your life going to improve if I give you $1,000 right now? Think about that for a moment. And now think about how much your life would improve if you already had $10 million and I paid you $1,000. Well, if you already had $10 million, that additional $1,000 really isn't going to help you very much in life. But if I paid you $1,000 right now, assuming you're not already a multimillionaire, I'm probably going to increase your quality of life by a decent amount. This is what risk aversion is picking up on. Lots of people exhibit risk averse behavior in the real world. Think about insurance. Insurance lives on risk aversion. Every time you buy insurance, doesn't matter if it's medical insurance, car insurance, homeowners insurance, whatever, you're going to be losing money in expectation. But that doesn't mean insurance is a bad bet. You willingly pay this loss because there are some catastrophic outcomes. If you crash your car, if your house burns down, or goodness, if you get cancer or something awful like that, you want to avoid having really serious consequences in your life that you are unable to pay for because of how negative of an outcome those things will impose on you. So you buy insurance to smooth your outcome. Yeah, you lose money in expectation, but you make these really bad outcomes look not so bad, just kind of awful. For me, I actually fall in this risk-averse category. I answered X equal to $400,000 to the original question. One thing that's interesting is this is actually different than the last time I produced a video like this. Last time I produced a video like this was five years ago, it was 2011, and I answered X equal to $300,000. It's interesting to think about what caused the change in my X value here, and I think I have a good answer for this. Five years ago, I was a grad student. My financial future was looking less secure, wasn't exactly sure what I would be doing with my life. I would hope to get a job and be a professor and hope to make a lot of money like that, but I didn't really know whether I would actually be able to do that or not. Five years later, I do know that. I'm a postdoc right now. I've defended my PhD. I have an assistant professorship lined up for me starting next year. My life is much more financially secure. And as a result, I am more willing to endure risk. 
So as a result of me being more willing to endure risk, I need to receive a higher X value, in this case $400,000, to make me want to take the sure thing rather than play that gamble from before. The last of the three categories is risk acceptant. If you answered X greater than $500,000, you would fall under this category. Some other people might call it risk-loving or risk-seeking, but it's all the same thing, risk, risk acceptant. What this means is that you value each additional dollar more than the last. Very, very, very few people report these risk acceptant preferences in this experiment that I ran. This is reasonable. Risk acceptant behavior is like a compulsive gambler. When you're dealing with this high of stakes, you really don't see very many people willing to exhibit that kind of preference. One interesting question that follows from all of this is, can we represent these sorts of risk preferences with utility functions? And the answer is we can. It's actually very easy. One common way to model these risk utility functions is to use exponents. So if you're risk neutral, your expected utility is simply x. Meanwhile, if you're risk averse, here's where the exponents come into play. You get a value of x to the a, where a is some number between 0 and 1. If it's been a while since you've played around with exponential functions, what happens when you have an exponent that's less than 1 is the exponential function essentially starts acting like a root function. So if a is equal to 1 half, then you're really square rooting x. If a is equal to 1 third, then you are cube rooting x, and so forth. The smaller x is, the more risk averse you are. Whereas when a is getting closer and closer to 1, that's making you closer and closer to risk neutral. Because when a is equal to 1, then you have a utility function of just u equal to x, like in the risk neutral case. Lastly, if you're risk acceptant, we can model that sort of utility function by taking x to the a, but now where a is greater than 1, just as a normal exponential function would work. You can actually see how these things function by taking a look at a graph of some examples. This red line here is a risk neutral payoff. On your x-axis, we have the amount of money that you're winning, and on the y-axis, we have your utility. Notice that that increases linearly. There is no sort of bend to the function. Your utility is simply equal to your amount of money won. The purple line is an example of a risk-averse utility function. It's still increasing as the amount of money that you win is increasing, but notice that it starts increasing at a slower rate. The amount of money that you win up front is going to provide you with a larger increase in your happiness level as compared to a gain later on as you've already won some amount of money. Risk acceptance, the blue line, works the opposite way. Here, initially, you're not winning very much money in terms of your utility, but as the amount of money won goes up and up and up, you're increasing even faster how much happiness you gain by that. You can see this by looking at the difference between the uh, happiness, the utility value going from 0 to 1 versus 0 to 2. 0 to 1 makes a decent increase, but 0 to 2 for this particular utility function, we can't even see how high your utility jumps to in that case because it's jumping up at such a high level in that case. So this individual is actually very risk acceptant. Next question is, how can we incorporate these sorts of risk preferences into games? Well, the answer is that we just do it. It's very easy. You can do this, no problem. There is nothing in our axioms, remember completeness, transitivity, independence over lotteries and continuity, nothing in those axioms stopped us from having these sorts of preferences. And that's, again, the goal of expected utility. The goal of expected utility is to stop thinking about outcomes as outcomes and start thinking about them as how happy you are about these outcomes. Stop thinking about $1 versus $20 versus $50 and start thinking about how happy you are if you win $1 or $2 or $20 or $50 or $100. So if we have a game that looks like this, these are dollars that players are winning. If we write down their utilities as this, then we are making the assumption that each of these individuals is risk neutral. If that weren't the case, then we shouldn't use these utilities. We should do it a little bit differently. 
Maybe, in fact, player one is risk averse, and it just so happens that square rooting his utilities, or rather his dollar values, gives us an accurate representation of his preferences over these outcomes. Well, in that case, we don't use the blue numbers like this. We take the square roots of them, and this is what we should be putting into our game matrix. Maybe player two is actually risk acceptant and not risk neutral. Similar story here. We shouldn't be using the red numbers. We should be using the utilities. The utility here, maybe squaring the amount of money that she wins, accurately represents her preferences over those outcomes. And so instead of using those red numbers, we square those numbers and we use these instead. This is something that I have tried to reinforce throughout this course. When we have numbers inside of a matrix or inside of a game tree, that is the be-all end all of the preference. So when we start writing down payoffs, whether it's in a matrix or a game tree, we need to make sure that we're representing preferences accurately. That way we don't have to double think these sorts of things once it's already in the matrix or already in the game tree. So it's very easy to incorporate these risk preferences, whether you're risk neutral, risk acceptant, or risk averse. Doesn't matter, you can do all of these things very easily, but just make sure that you've done that before you start playing around with payoffs in a matrix or a game tree. All right, so that wraps up this lecture on risk preferences, and we are actually done now with this unit on expected utility theory. So join me next time when we start getting into repeated games. You'll start seeing some cool things with the prisoner's dilemma and repeated prisoner's dilemmas, and how cooperation can transpire between two actors, even though in the one-shot prisoner's dilemma, they always defect on each other. It's pretty neat stuff. Hope to see you then. Take care.